Okay. Um, so uh, my name is Jennifer Hudak. Um, I am a writer mostly of short stories, although I am working on a novel. Um, and I have a little bit of experience just over the last few years doing readings um, and other types of presentations online. Um, I also teach yoga online. That's my day job, uh, purely an online yoga teacher. So I was joking at my reading earlier that I felt like asking everyone how their bodies were doing because that's kind of what I'm used to doing online. <laughs> Don, you're next to me. You want to go? Sure. Uh, my name is Don Vogel. My pronouns are she, her. I am a uh, writer and editor. And uh, basically, in the past three years, I've gotten a lot of experience with doing mm -hmm. online presentations and readings, much like Jennifer said. Um, and I have a little bit of a theater background, very, very little, mostly in high school, but Having that combined with just the whole idea of oral storytelling is, I think, some ways that I have tried to put together to make online readings sort of almost as cool as they can be in person. Well, I am Thiago Ambrosio Laje. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. I'm Brazilian, maybe you can notice by the strong accent, <laughs> and I'm a professor in food science and engineering and biotechnology. And I'm not very used to online readings of my fiction. I've read only for small groups in for study groups in fiction, but I'm very used to online teaching because of the pandemic. Is had to to resort to the emergential remote teaching. We, we didn't call it. Uh, education by distance here because it was emergency or it was a, a exception né, to be teaching online but now uh, teaching online came to stay with us so I got used to teaching online I write mostly short stories and I'm working on uh, my first novel too <laughs> uh, but my stories are uh, almost all of them are in Portuguese I have only one short story in English so I just pulled up the email that has Wendy's questions in it. So oh. I'm willing to pitch in, hit until awesome. she gets here. Um, so her first question that she asked is, uh, what are some ch common challenges writers face when reading their work in front of an audience or in the case of online readings when you can't see your audience? I can jump in with that. So I also have a theater background, by the way, Don. So I think that um, that helps for sure. But I, I feel like um, whether you're reading online or in person, um, knowing where to look is is a hard thing. So if you're, I mean, if you're reading in person too, like how much do you look up at the audience? How much do you just look down at your at your a story or whatever you're reading. And I feel like that's compounded a little bit online because you're not actually looking at your audience when you're online. I feel like when you look up at the computer, you see yourself. And I have noticed in some readings um, that I've attended over the last few years, uh, it's easy to get distracted when you're seeing yourself, you're much more aware of what your facial expressions are and how you're looking. Um, and sometimes that can be it can just come across as very um, affected a little bit when you're when you're overly overly kind of distracted by looking at yourself. But it's really hard not to be if you are looking up at all. Plus the fact that you're looking kind of askance because the camera is kind of up there. So uh, I think it's also difficult because when you are teaching or reading uh, in person, you can make the micro adjustments while you read on the expression and general mood in the room. It's kind of hard to explain. In theater, people can feel it more strongly. You have this instant feedback from the audience, maybe from facial expressions or body language, and you don't have this online. So you must all 
you're reading your story and be able to go through it without any kind of external guidance. For me, it's very difficult because you have to, to match it so you can do it without this kind of, of signs. So for me, it, it was very difficult because uh, in person, I teach very long classes here. I, I always be uh, changing between classes and reading. And we must make some pauses, uh, give some specific moments we need to breath, né? the yoga teachers. <laughs> so I'm, I'm a lot about breath is, uh, to us. And online, you, you can't do, do that. You, you don't have cues to, to do that. I, uh, I have a specific passage that I like to read from one of my novels when I'm doing live readings. And I found that it doesn't go over nearly as well when I'm doing it online because there is a real gross out moment in this. And I love seeing everybody's brains turning <laughs> and realizing what's happening and just doing that without a live audience it makes it a lot more complicated because i know that people are probably you know cringing and making ooh noises but i can't hear it or see it and so i have to remember to slow myself down for that part so that they're not missing what i'm saying next Another interesting thing, and I will mention this because I see that neither of you are wearing a pair of glasses, but watch my face as I turn to the left. Mm -hmm. And there goes the blue blocking in my glasses. Um, I did a reading once where somebody said that they thought I looked like the little girl from Dune with the glowing blue eyes, because if I'm looking at a white screen, it kicks in the blue blocking. If I make my screen darker, it doesn't do that. So that's, a yeah, it, it's a... It's one of those things that is not something you would necessarily think about, but on a practical level, it's there and it causes some problems for an online reading. So that actually, can I just ask a quick question Absolutely. kind of following up on that? So um, is it, do, when you do online readings or whatever, do you tend to read from a screen? or do you tend to print something out or read from a book? When I've done them online, I almost always read off of a screen. And mm -hmm. the one trick that I've learned on this is that if you adjust the color of your screen and make it very orangish, it cancels out the blue blocking. So um, mm -hmm. I'm actually reading tomorrow and you'll be able to see that because I will be reading from a screen that I will color shift so that it won't make my eyes turn blue like that. <laughs> but Jennifer, I noticed yeah, that, that in your reading helped. earlier today, you were reading from paper. And is that your preference? I, I am mostly because I'm I'm old and <laughs> I can't. I first of all I'm I'm, I'm on a laptop and so I, it looks to me like you have two screens. I do. Is that true? So yeah, I have one screen and the idea of reading of calling up my um, document and not being able to kind of check in with what's happening on the screen. Um, I, I, I just can't, I can't get my head around that. So I do print out my stuff for sure. I also, it's just easier for me to read from paper, but I was curious what you guys did. What about you, Thiago? Uh, I'm, I prefer to read on paper, but I tend to read from the screen uh, because it's more practical and my printer only works when it wants to. It's the first machine to rebel here. Mm -hmm. uh, I spent three days trying to make it work last week. So I tend to read uh, directly from the screen. Uh, and for me, it's kind of hard to read from the screen to time the, the scrolling with the reading. I, I tend to have some jumps and some hiccups when I reach the end of the screen and forgot to roll the screen up. The mm -hmm. turn pages is more natural for yep. me because I, I'm old too. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think we're all there at varying uh, degrees yeah. of old. <laughs> yes, uh, even for, for reading for myself to, to make some revisions and stuff, if I'm able to, I will print my work. Uh, it's not very eco-friendly, sorry, but... Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> Um, when you're giving a reading or a presentation of some sort, do you ever try to memorize what you're going to say, or do you 
rely on that printed or screen version um, because memories are fickle. I mean, I, I, I feel like when I am reading my own work, I have, especially because it's short fiction is what I'm, I've read in the past. I have read these stories through so much that I do have, um, I wouldn't say that I have them memorized, but I, I know them pretty well. So I can, I do need to rely. I have never actually memorized an entire thing and read it without the, the words in front of me, but I can look up periodically for sure and not worry about completely losing my place. Um, because I do tend to have such a, a huge, a huge, um. Like, just, I, I've already committed so much of it to memory. I also, I will say, though, that when I have to talk about other things, um, whether something I want to make sure I mention in introductions or something like that, I write that down <laughs> because I won't, I won't remember it otherwise. What about you, Tiago? Uh, I'm on the same boat as Jennifer. Uh, I think that... Uh, the more I read the same text over and over again, I kind of create in my mind some touchstone inside the text that there are some safe places. And I get from one place to another, even when the, the, the path is kind of fusing in my head, I can read it. So I, I try to, to memorize at least where the tension is mm -hmm. so I can prepare myself. So I can read and no, no, the next phrase, it's going to be this way. So now I have to act more relaxed. So the tension uh, appears more. Uh, it's not memorizing, but it's not slow memorizing. Eh? It's mm -hmm. uh, somewhere between. And for other stuff, I need to write at least the bullet point because I, I tend to forget and to thank people. I need to write all the names down. Uh, it's very hard. I think poetry uh, relies more on memory because you have the metrics to help you uh, to orient yourself inside mm -hmm. the text. I think I don't read poetry, so I, I can say for sure. Yeah, I, I can definitely see that some on poetry if it's something that has meter and possibly something mm -hmm. that has rhyme because that it's sort of a mnemonic that helps you remember it. But I am, I'm the same when it comes to short stories and stuff. I will often have a phrase or something that I commit to memory enough that I can give that sort of looking at the camera or looking at the audience in a live situation where you know, it's usually just a simple little bit of dialogue that's very telling of a certain character or something like that so that I can just I can deliver that more more theatrically than more mm -hmm. reading wise but yeah again I memory like I said is fickle and there is no way I could memorize even even things like drabbles where it's only a hundred mm -hmm. words no I gave up memorizing stuff a long time ago <laughs> it, it, there is one more thing yeah. That as we were talking about short stories, né, I think the shorter a story is, uh, more precise the language is. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. you, we need to have the, the really correct words yes. to convey the, the fact that you want to. It's not just telling a story. So it's, for me, it's impossible to memorize. <laughs> I just can't. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, even with Jennifer and I having both had theater in our background, you know, we memorized lines, I'm sure, but it's a lot of work. And my brain these days is not interested in that much work. It's just not necessary. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Let's yeah. save the energy for, for all this stuff. All the work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I will say that something that I do often, if I have multiple um, characters, that all have dialogue um, is I'll sometimes highlight their dialogue in different color highlighter so that I remember, uh, cause I try to vary my voice a little mm -hmm. bit with different characters so that it's clear when I'm moving back and forth. Um, but sometimes I have to, like, I literally need that visual cue like, oh, right, this is the deep voiced one <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> so that I, as I'm reading it, I don't have to think too hard about it. Yeah, I actually do that as well. And 
my my novel that I like to read the scene from involves five characters, which is not easy to do. But basically what I've done um, mentally is that one of the characters is here, one of the characters is here, one's here, one's here, and then one's straight forward. And so as I read their lines, you know, if I'm reading if I'm reading the character that's up here, I will look in that direction slightly. And it also reminds me to pitch my voice in that direction. So in, in my case, there are three female characters and two male characters. One of the male characters actually does have a fairly high pitched voice. He's a teenage boy. Um, so, you know, I basically, I give everybody sort of a physical space that is for both visually looking at and also to remind me to put my voice in that character's range. And it's difficult, but it's one way to do it when you have, when you've decided, yeah, I'm going to read this thing with my ensemble cast that seemed like a really good idea at the time. Um, there, there's a, a uh, someone in the chat asked if there's any tips on adjusting light screen, et cetera. And I thought that was a really good question. Um, yeah. So for me, I'm on a Windows based machine and I go into the set the settings for the display and there are ways to adjust the tint and the color. And that's where I do that is I just I shift everything down to like this kind of very pale orange color. Mm -hmm. And that that helps with my with my glasses in particular, but just um it also, I feel like, makes it a little easier on my eyes, and some people may find that with different colors, mm -hmm. um, just, you know, depending on your own eyesight and your own eye shape. Um, yeah, it's, it's, for me, it's, that's been a, a definite uh, learning process. And, and right now, so this where I'm sitting right now, I can tell it was the perfect place to be earlier in the day. And now I can see, I'm realizing the light is coming through the skylights and ah. making me look like uh, an alien's coming down from here or something <laughs> like that. So, um, like the, the, you might have a go-to spot, um, but it also might change over the course of the day. And Absolutely. I know that for my, when I'm teaching my, yoga classes, and, and this does relate, um, you think about your background. There are definitely some backgrounds that make it easier to see a person in front of, and some backgrounds that make it much harder to see a person in front of. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think that, um, I think for online readings, the, I, I spend more time thinking about the sound quality than about the visuals, because I feel like that's kind of what probably people are going to be paying the most attention to. Um, and so I do use a little mini mic, um, a little road mini mic that plugs into my computer. Um, because if I don't use that, I find that my voice sounds tinny um, and it's a little harder to understand with just my laptop basic microphone. I'm not sure if I should give some tips because I'm not following them. So <laughs> I have a light just over me and my bald head. <laughs> and a huge reflection here and on the wall behind, behind me. So uh, just do use a light over you, <laughs> especially if you are bald. <laughs> if I'm bald okay, we put some powder here to, uh, to diminish the reflection. And try to put a light in on your side on like a 45 degree. Mm. There are a lot of, of tutorials that go in, in very detail of what kind of lights you should use. Uh, but if I can give one tip that maybe the problem that uh, Jennifer is having is to not rely much on natural light. Because natural light can change even while you are reading. Oh, <laughs> and okay. you start reading in, in the light, and if the sun goes down, just like it's 6 and 20 here in the night, uh, the light and the, the conditions will change. Uh, so I think the best uh, tip for sound or, or video or, or lighting that I can give is to set your uh, surroundings and get your microphone and make a short recording 
of mm. reading and check this record and see if you can see you uh, nicely if the background is okay if the sound quality is okay now make a small test it, it will take only five or ten minutes and give you more um, confidence to mm -hmm. make the reading online after yeah absolutely that's great advice um I mentioned this a little bit when I was talking about the piece that I read with, you know, five characters, but how do you choose what pieces to read? And is the number of characters a factor, for example, or, um, you know, Jennifer, you read earlier today and you had a lot of cozy pieces, which were very nice. And it, it felt like a warm cup of coffee to hear all of those, even the, even the slightly darker one. <laughs> I mean, I do stress a lot about what to read. Um, and I do think too, like um, what Thiago was saying earlier about when you're reading online and you don't get that feedback from people, um, that factors into my decision for sure. Um, there are some pieces that I feel like work really well um, when I can kind of play off the audience a little bit. Um, and when I'm reading online, I won't, read those. I'll choose different, different pieces to read. Um, for me also, yeah, I mean, I have a story. Um, I have a story called the cat lady and the petitioner that has so many speaking characters because all the cats have their own voice. Mm -hmm. Um, and I have never been brave enough to try to read that one anywhere. Although the person who read it for the podcast did an amazing job. <laughs> I'm so impressed. Um, but also for me, I feel like, um, I often tend to read, because I tend to write um, things that border on literary, um, but the stories that I tend to read often are more, um, I don't know, casually written, because I feel like I like to be able to, like I'm talking to someone, I like to have something to perform a little bit. Um, and, and particularly if I'm doing it online and I can't, I don't get that feedback from people. Um, I like to have something that I know is a little bit more of a performance, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. What about you, Thiago? How do you choose your pieces to read? Uh, I choose basically more on the audience than uh, to whom I'm reading. Uh, but as I read mostly in, in closed groups, uh, studying or, or changing critiques and this kind of stuff. So I had to, to choose based on the production we were mm -hmm. making. And I had to read also in Spanish. Uh, I don't speak Spanish. I, I kind of, of, because Portuguese and Spanish are very similar. And in Brazil, we have the delusion that we can pretend we speak Spanish and people are going to understand it. It's kind of a collective delusion here in Brazil. Uh, it, we call this mixed language Portuñol. It's a mix of Portuguese and Spanish. And I had to read in Spanish, and it was awful. <laughs> because I, I had the text in Spanish, but I don't know how to read, how to pronounce the, the letters. I didn't know. Uh, but in this case, uh, it was a group of mostly Spanish speaking people and I had to read this text and people were uh, patient with me with my accent and etc. So uh, I can think that sometimes we must know that the audience wants to listen to us. Mm. They are ready also to forgive and mistake and small mistakes that you make and, uh, and embrace your reading, even if it's not perfect uh, in any sense. Yeah. The, the the language barrier that you just brought up is also a valuable thing to think about when you're choosing something to read. I have this strange tendency to name my stories not in English and not necessarily <laughs> in languages that I speak well. So sometimes I'll have a title and I'll be like, well, this is how I say it in my head. And that's probably not even close to right. Or also character names that come from non-English dominant cultures. I'm like, I think I know how to say this, but I don't. I, I had one story where I used a bunch of uh, Celtic names and I will never do that again. <laughs> Those names are very, very complex to pronounce correctly. <laughs> um, 
so we've talked a little bit about this question, but um, you know, when you're doing an online reading as opposed to an in-person reading, how do you engage with the audience or do you sort of let that go by the wayside for an online reading because it's a little bit more complicated to engage with the audience? I mean, I, I wish I could engage more with the audience to be perfectly honest. Like I, I, um, I think that it's, it's, it's hard to engage, um, you know, a lot of people when they go to readings, uh, turn their camera off, which I totally, totally get, um, because you're want to be doing whatever you're doing while you're listening. Um, but I, if, if I do see people with their camera on, I do tend to find my, I find myself looking for those people, uh, because it's, I do wish that I had a little bit more, um, kind of, um, just just a sense of how people are listening i guess that's that's what makes online reading so hard for me personally yeah what about you tiago i i think that i don't know if there is a way to engage with the audience uh, because even when we teach a, a class online uh, most of students uh, that should be participating on class doesn't part of class and just to watch or to listen to a reading uh, it's not expected to the audience to to take part on on it actively uh, on the reading so i think that the only way that we have to engage somehow with the audience is with the the story itself with the reading itself uh, just deliver the best uh, possible work that you can have to 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 read and make it of course, just like um, Jennifer said earlier, uh, like a performance, uh, so people can engage. But I, I want to know about you, though, because you are reading the questions and you are not talking very much about your process. <laughs> uh, I, feel like I, I feel like I've said something about, you, about so. my own as well. But um, <laughs> yeah, I, I find it much easier to to engage with the audience in person, um, you know, when when you're online, there one of the things that uh, I like to do is to sort of ask people if there's like a specific thing that they a specific more like I like to give my audience a choice when I can. And so mm -hmm. um, what I might do is I might say, okay, I have these two possible stories that I could read that are very short. Um, would you rather hear the story about this or would you rather hear the story about this? And be, basically so be prepared brave. to do either of them. I, I also, Jennifer, I think you know this about me. I write a lot. I have a <laughs> lot of stories to choose from. So, so um, yeah, I have, I have been willing to do that in order to um, sort of give the audience a little bit more participation when I'm doing an online reading. Hello, Wendy, welcome. Sorry, we got started without you. I, I apologize, My the schedule is like, everything on my schedule is in a new place. Oh, I just didn't realize, and I, I really apologize for being late. No worries. We've been we've been working through the list. I've been sort of uh, pinch hitting as moderator. Um, I also just noticed that I'm seeing some questions pop up at the bottom of my screen, and then I can't figure out where they went to. So if I missed somebody's question, I'm really sorry. I did see one uh, pop up just briefly, and maybe we can um, start with this and let uh, Wendy get situated. But then also we'll ask this question uh, I'm of her. Yeah, I have my questions. I, I what have you discussed so far? Um, if I may so ask we you. were just talking about engaging with the audience. I, I've been going down them in order. So we're we're on your number five. But um, okay. the question the question that I saw pop up from the audience is um, whether folks prefer to read things that have been previously published or things that have not been published yet. Oh, that's a good um, point. So uh, Jennifer, what do you think? Um, I almost always read things that have been published before. Um, especially um, in an online reading, because you don't know, 
I mean, I'm, I'm wary of someone recording it and then like burning my first audio rights basically. So, um, and that's definitely something even, even in a reading where people are explicitly saying that they're not, you know, the venue is not recording it. Um, you just don't know if someone's going to record it. And so sure. I, I definitely read things that are, um, already published. If the venue is not recording it, um, I don't worry quite so much about, um, whether the exclusivity has expired, but if it is being recorded, like, for example, certain reading series that are that keep their recordings up on YouTube, I do check my contract and make sure that my, um, that period of exclusivity has expired and that, um, I do have audio rights to be able to do that. Yeah. Wendy, any thoughts on that? Well, I agree with Jennifer about only reading published work. The only exception is if I'm in person and I mean, I visit visibly can see that there's nobody there holding a tape recorder out. Mm -hmm. um, I do like to use my local open mic to um, kind of experiment with to see how the audience reacts to things before I send it to the publisher. Okay. But if it's online, I wouldn't do it at all. I mean, there's just too many instances where your work could be taken and audio rights are a real thing these days. Um, podcasting is everywhere. People are hungry for content there, and that is definitely a market you want to tap with your writing. So, yeah, yeah, yeah this is this is a serious thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for all of us panelists here at flights, we all had to sign a contract before we came on specifying that we do allow what we're saying here to be uh, used by flights, uh, right. which and I, I assume all of us did because we're here and, it's, <laughs> and I believe it's being recorded. So, yeah. yes. And and specifically at Flights of Foundry, the, re the readings are not recorded. Mm -hmm. um, those yeah. they won't ever put up online. But yeah, like Jennifer said, there are some online reading series that do end up putting their things on Facebook Live or YouTube or whatever. Um, Thiago, did you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, there is one more point uh, besides uh, these worries about the, the rights of publication of people stealing our work. That the safe that you read the red publishing uh, story because this story has passed on uh, the editorial process. It was edited. It was a story that is already polished in its best form. I think mm -hmm. it's also safer in this kind of way, unless you are, uh, like Ben said, trying to experiment. Now with some time, but in this case, uh, we can find smaller audience and safer places to expose and publish a book. One of the other things I've found with reading stuff that's previously been published is that I've occasionally taken part in readings where I don't necessarily get to read the entirety of the story. Mm -hmm. And in a case like that, it's wonderful to be able to say, and if you've liked what you've heard so far, here's the book where you can find the rest. And then that can drive sales to that book. And I mean, that that happens when you're reading an excerpt from a novel as well, that you you then have that option to say, yeah, I can't read the whole novel for you, but here it is. You can go buy it in the dealer's room or online or, you know, wherever. And I was just going to say, following following up on that, even even with um, things that are free to read online, I have been in uh, readings before where the um, moderator or host has put a link to the story in the chat at the start of the reading because sometimes it's easier for people to follow along a reading if they can read along um, the on with the text while while I'm reading. So that's that's a nice thing that that you can do. That's a great Especially point. Especially for non non native speakers, <laughs> it helps a lot. Right, yeah. and for people yeah. that are learning the language too, yeah. uh, it helps a lot. There's there's also, I mean, I'm I'm one of these people. If I can read something as I'm hearing it, I retain it a lot better. Mm -hmm. And so, if I want to really remember a story that someone is reading to me, if I can read it at the same time, that's mm -hmm. really valuable to the way that my brain works. And I think that's something that's more indicative of online readings as opposed to in person. Mm -hmm. um, these opportunities to match up different forms of media are a lot easier when we're here online. 
than if you're just sitting in a room or standing in a room speaking to an audience. They really, I, I wouldn't say there's a disadvantage. Um, there is a little more um, speaker and audience interaction when you're mm -hmm. in person, because as all of you probably uh, realize, uh, we're sitting here talking on a panel, but we don't see the audience. We don't know right. the reactions. We don't know if what we're saying is um, getting a positive response or not. Uh, I find that's the one aspect of online um, uh, readings and speaking that I, I just don't really like as much. But, you know, especially during the pandemic times, we all learn to get along and yep, do yep. that because this was the main way of reaching out to people. And And I find that I still do enjoy the access that online readings give to me as a as a poet and as an author. I can have a much bigger reach. I mean, just last month I did a reading in India um, mm. and I pre-recorded it and sent it and everything. So again, I don't see the audience reaction, but uh, it, it gave me access to a continent I probably wouldn't have any access to at all. So it's it's really a wonderful thing, this technology that we have. It's, it is, it's yeah. It's remarkable. Yeah. So this question is probably still relevant even in the digital age, and that is how do you handle nerves or stage fright when you're reading? I mean, there is a value to your audience can't see you when you're doing an online read, or you can't see your audience, rather, mm -hmm. when they can see you, hopefully. Um, <laughs> But how do you deal with nerves or stage fright? Tiago, would you like to go first? I, I drink a lot of water. I have been sick <laughs> this cup already. And <laughs> uh, I, I, it's just like the song from, from, from the week. Uh, it's time to close my eyes and leap because you have to, to throw yourself at it. Uh, we have the, the stage fright. When you are reading online, your stage is as big as the world, the world. Uh, just like now, we're being recorded, we're going to be put on YouTube, and we have no idea how many people we can reach. Yeah. So this is very oppressive. And sometimes to pretend to be reading for friends uh, and trying to have a positive outlook, like I said, that people want to enjoy your, your words, your stories, you're reading, there are no, no enemies there to, to listen to you. So you can make a time safe uh, space inside your head and try to expand it to, to be around everyone. But it's kind of hard. It's, I, I just try to ignore and, and drink up more water and, and go because there's not much to do. I don't know. Yeah. What about you, Jennifer? Um. So because I was in theater, I don't get stage fright as much as maybe some other people do, but I do get that kind of like little jitter at the beginning. And, and I will say that um, less so reading online. So I think actually doing, there are some like online readings that you can sign up to do if you're nervous, if you, if you do have stage fright, um, reading online might actually be easier than reading in person, just because you don't have a wall of faces looking at you. It just kind of feels like you're, especially if you, like Diago said, practice ahead of time in your house, you're used to it. You're used to sitting there reading your own work. Um, it, it It's a little bit more um, reasonable, I think. Um, and I also think um, as much as you want to look good for a reading, like I value comfort so much. Um, but like whatever comfort means to you, if comfort means like putting on a fascinator and like tons of makeup, because that's what makes you feel great. Like do that before you're reading. I am in yoga pants right now because that, <laughs> like I am not wearing hard pants if I don't have to. So I think um, taking care of yourself and making sure that you feel comfortable and hydrated for sure um, is a great way to make sure that you're just like feeling confident and prepared. Sure. Wendy. Well, I uh, like uh, Jennifer. I mean, I speak a lot and I don't really I don't really feel the old stage fright the way I did back in the day. And frankly, I, I cut my teeth teaching high school and, you know, having 35 to 40 teenagers looking at your every move and every word you say, 
uh, day in, day out, cures you very quickly, <laughs> stage fright. <laughs> um, but I, I do have some techniques. Um, I, I did feel a little nervous talking in front of my city council uh, last, uh, I think it was two weeks ago, because I have to give a report as their poet laureate. Uh, but what I did is when I, I was sitting down, I used breathing techniques. I breathe in, I breathe out. And for me, the nervousness is usually a very rapid heartbeat. Mm -hmm. And I just keep doing the techniques until I feel my heart rate slow. And I remind myself I've done this how many dozens, hundreds, thousands of times before. And that the people out there are just human beings like myself. They may have a title, but that doesn't make them any more or any less human. And I, I try to just go at it at that way. And usually that's enough to calm me these days. But I do remember being very shy about speaking. I I was uh, an introvert when I was young and I hardly even knew how to speak because I was so quiet, I never spoke. I know that's hard to believe now, <laughs> but, uh, but I was a, a very shy, reclusive um, young woman, and it took a heck of a lot to get me to come out of my shell. And I think that's why I enjoy speaking now, because it was such a challenge for me in the beginning that it's like it's, I don't know, staring in the face of my own, uh, <laughs> my own ad adversity, I guess. But um, yeah, but breathing techniques, I, I think that is the main thing that I would recommend learning to do. It's interesting that all of us have teaching experience of one sort or another. And I think that that, because I, I taught uh, undergrads for two years while I was getting my master's degree. And so I think, I think having that background and then also the theater background, it just, it helps a lot of that stage fright just sort of be a, yeah, that's a thing. And some people do deal with that, but maybe for us, it's not as much of a thing as it might be for people, for authors who don't have that experience. So that breathing technique totally. is a really great, great mm -hmm. recommendation. And, it does and I think it comes down to practice too, right? Yeah. I mean, because that's like, basically, you know, if you've been teaching for a long time, you've had a ton of practice speaking in front of people. Um, and so I think Viago's suggestion too, to like practice in front of your friends or your family or your cat yeah. or whatever, just kind of practice reading yeah. to other other uh, beings. Um, the more you do it, the easier it is. It's not as scary the, the, the more practice you've had. I definitely recommend humans over cats, though, because the cats will act like they're bored and wander off, and that's not good for anybody's ego. True, true. Got to catch them when they're really sleepy. Yes. <laughs> well, okay. So we, we uh, have... Just one more word. In the yeah. Case, right? That I think we can uh, make a, a division between two kinds of stage fright that people can suffer today. There is this classic stage fright that we're talking mostly about that you overcame by teaching and then by reading. And there is the online anxiety uh, with the recording and everything online is forever. I think it's a, a mm. second kind of stage fright that can happen more frequently with online reading. And that one is kind of hard because we are not used to this yet. Uh, we try to act like no, the online community internet is the fact of life, but everything is new, everything is always changing. So uh, maybe for this second anxiety, we still don't have the the, the recipes and words or, or exercise that can help us overcome it. Now, I'm a very anxious. So for example, whenever I'm going to a flight, I'm in the airport, I start thinking and if a gun has materialized it between my underwear. Uh, and if I'm carrying uh, uh, a light uh, hamster in my pocket and I didn't see it, if I don't have any kind of pet. And for the anxious mind, <laughs> uh, this kind of scenarios. And if I talk something uh, extremely uh, unacceptable, without mm -hmm. even having conscience uh, that I'm speaking horrible things and this is going to be recorded and so, so it is uh, it's a topic that we can think a lot about it yet and the conversation that we're going to have uh, for the next year I think 
-hmm. All right, we're getting close to the end of our time and I want to give everybody a chance to uh, give any final thoughts that you might have, uh, anything that we didn't talk about and also tell us uh, where you can find us online, where you can, where we can find you online. Yes, those are the, see, this is what Thiago was just saying about the words that come out of your mouth when you're being recorded. Um, <laughs> Wendy, why don't you go ahead and go first? Oh, okay. Um, again, sorry for being late. My, I just didn't realize the panel was starting this hour. It's a good thing I decided to come in and check early for the, <laughs> when I thought it was going to be. Uh, but anyway, uh, my name is Wendy Van Camp. I am the Poet Laureate for the city of Anaheim, California. I'm a poetry editor of Speculative Poetry Books and a speculative poet and artist. You can find me on my website at wendyvancamp.com. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And Thiago? Uh, I put my handle in the, the chat because I'm bad at spelling in English. Uh, is it? Uh, just do it. Write, rant, uh, let's do the world with our stories, with a lot of voices that wasn't heard uh, so much before. Eh? And our voices can be stronger together and is it just do it, read it. Perfect. Thank you. Jennifer. Yeah, uh, I was going to say something very similar, which is, even though we talked a lot about, you know, like my lighting is awful right now and not relying on your computer's microphone and everything. I think. Like, you don't really need anything special to to do an on like, if you want to do an online reading and you don't have a separate mic cares. Just do it anyway. I think that's, I think, you know, if you have the ability to go online, do it. Like, just have fun with it. I think that's, I think, like, we, everyone wants to hear stories, and the more stories, the better. Um, and yes, yeah, so my handle is on Twitter. I'm still on Twitter. I don't know why. Uh, Hudak writes, H U D A K W R I T E S. Um, and you can also find me on my website, jenniferhudakwrites.com. Perfect. And I am Don Vogel. Um, you can find me on line. The best place is my website, which is history that never was .com. Um, and also I am doing a reading here at flags of foundry tomorrow evening. Uh, it is in our. 33, which is uh, 7 p.m. Pacific time, um, if you want to do the math from there. But I will be reading from Droplets from the Universe, which is my next collection of joyful and humorous science fiction that comes out on Tuesday, the 18th. So um, I will read a few stories and maybe some poems out of this and uh, maybe one other thing that's not in this collection, but you can get a preview if you want to come to my reading. Um, thank you everybody for participating. Uh, it was a great conversation. And uh, if you have any more questions for us, our designated Discord room is the Houdini room. So we will, or at least I will be there. If anybody has any more questions about reading, I'll be happy to answer them. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Ta -ta.